Good morning. My name is Rosanna Selly, and I'll be reading the scripture today. I'm going to invite you to grab the Bible in the pew in front of you and turn. We're starting in Genesis. Or if you'd like to use one of your apps on your smart devices and follow along in the Bible there, you're welcome to do that. And today we're going to start in Genesis 14, verses 18 to 20. And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine, and he was priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abraham gave him one-tenth of everything. And then if you want to turn to Mark 12, 41 to 44. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in, put in everything she had, all she had to live on. And then from Matthew 19, 16 to 22. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. And if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Also, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all these. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. And so as we begin this morning, I want to name uh, some underlying assumptions that we've already heard kind of woven through the service this morning. Some of the songs that the band did contain this imagery. Um, everything that exists, everything that we are, everything that we have comes to us as a gift from God. It's one of those foundational realities and understandings of our faith that uh, intellectually people generally will agree to, right? Um, but then once we have the things in our possessions, uh, we kind of lose track of that and we like to hold them really tightly, you know. And sometimes we even begin to think that um, they are ours because we earned them and we deserve them and we're particularly good in some way, right? It's just part of that way in which we're wired. Uh, our human nature seems to be more drawn to hold and to protect and to conserve than it is to give and to share and to release but we begin with the assumption that everything that we are and everything that we have is given to us as a gift by God. Now, I sometimes hear it said uh, that the church talks about money too much. Uh, I'm actually going to offer the opposite as a contention this morning. Now, I think the reality is that the church does not talk about money enough, but when we do talk about it, it's often in unhelpful ways. The reason that I'd say I don't think we talk about money enough is uh, because of so many of the realities in which we live today. And I uh, did all this research, and I had this big section written in my sermon, and it got axed earlier in the week because uh, I know you like to get out if you're roughly on time, however we define on time. Uh, but the research continues to be pretty compelling that persons today in various socioeconomic levels are struggling with and strapped by debt of different kinds of different origins, uh, but crippled sometimes by debt nonetheless. Whether it's student loan debt that we've just accepted as a norm culturally, uh, whether it's credit card debt that we often just carry on cycles from month to month or card to card, uh, whether it's the payday lending institutions that trap so many people uh, in their practices. There are a number of persons who I hear say things to me like, I really feel like God is calling me to this thing 
whatever it is, right? Sometimes it's young adults who have a desire to pursue something different than they received their education in. Sometimes it's persons later in life who are preparing to retire or thinking about retirement or wanting to do something different, uh, but they're trapped because they need the dollars to pay the debt that has become controlling in their lives. And as I think about those realities, I think maybe the church hasn't done enough to talk in helpful ways about money and about stuff and about how we live in relationship with money and stuff. Because again, I think often when the church does talk about money, it's in unhelpful ways. Oftentimes when we talk about money, the conversation is some version of you, right? It's often coming from up front, or, you know, maybe if I'm trying to be really gentle, the finance chair will come and deliver the message, you know. But often in churches, the message is you need to give more so that the church can pay its bills. Have you ever been a part of a church where that was the conversation? Um, We have bills to pay and staff to pay and lights to keep on, and so we need you to give more. And when we talk about that, and the motivation is the survival of the institution, often the tools in the conversation become guilt and shame and manipulation, not particularly helpful. But what I want to invite us to begin thinking about is that our financial resources shared as a community of faith are not... Uh, disconnected people giving to some other body, right? You're not giving to the church in the same way that you might choose to contribute to your alma mater or to public radio or to other nonprofits that you care about. We are the church. And so when we share our financial resources as the church, what we're doing is saying that together we're going to pool our resources to pursue a common mission. We're going to use our resources to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And maybe there are buildings to maintain, and maybe there are utilities to pay, and maybe there is staff payroll, but all of those things are not the end and the reason that we give. Those are the means to pursue the mission together. And we're invited, as followers of Jesus, to give generously in our shared life together at the most fundamental level, Because giving generously is exactly who God is and what God does. And we are invited to reflect God's likeness as we grow in Christ's love for us and for the world. Right? God creates and God gives. God continues to pursue us as God's people. God sends Jesus into our midst who is the epitome of the sacrificial giver offering his life that we might again be in right relationship with God. And as we joyfully respond to the gifts that God gives to us, we are invited to give generously. And so I want to invite you this morning to kind of walk back through those scriptures that Rosanna read for a few minutes. We're going to look at different points in there, um, hopefully to understand the why we give. And then we'll talk a little bit about the how we give. We've already begun to dig into the why, right? Uh, As a joyful response to what God has done for us. Uh, But the why really begins for me in in the first uh, of those great stories, not the first one that we read in order, we'll go to Genesis in a minute, Uh, but in the first that we referenced this morning as the kids sang for us, right? That story from Mark's Gospel, the 12th chapter, I'd invite you to turn there, especially if you're carrying your Bible with you, right? Because each week in worship you have the opportunity to open up your Bible that you might read at other times during the week and to circle things and highlight things and underline things. Um, This is one of those stories that we love to teach the kids, you know, that we love to sing songs about. Uh, But it's got a pretty foundational, uh, difficult call to faithfulness embedded within it. Um, It's the 12th chapter, the very end of chapter 12 in Mark's gospel. Uh, Rosanna read verses 41 through 44. I won't read all of those again, but um, as context, right, Jesus is there watching people give to the treasury. That's the way in which they were supporting the religious institution in first century. Um, He watches wealthy people come and give in great abundance. And then he watches this poor widow come and give two coins that together might be worth a penny. And he calls the disciples' attention over to point out what he has seen happen. And starting in verse 21, he says this. Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. Now, realize that's not a mathematical or financial statement, right? It's about something different. More than all of those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, 
But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Now, now of note in this story would be that in the first century, uh, the community had of particular importance in their care a couple of categories of people. And the religious community was particularly charged with caring for widows and for orphans who would not have another system to provide them care. This woman who brings these two coins forward possibly received them from the same institution to which the, she's giving them, uh, but it's related to her relationship with God. A sense of trust and an understanding that God, who had given everything, would continue to give. And Jesus points out what she does and celebrates it because she gives all in the midst of that. It is a deeply sacrificial gift that shows the trust and the dependence that she has on God. An understanding that this widow has that her value, her worth, her identity, her position, they do not come from clinging to the small amount of resources that she has. It comes from releasing that and continuing to trust in God. Uh, establishing this pattern and this invitation that giving generously is a key part of following and living as a disciple of Jesus. So the invitation is to give generously. Uh, one of the definitions of generous is to go above what would be expected or required. And again, the invitation to do that is because that is exactly the nature of God who gives above what would be expected or required. But I invite you then to flip back to that Genesis 14 uh, that Rosanna read uh, for us this morning. Because this establishes for us a pattern uh, related to the how we give. And this is one of those places that I realize uh, people don't like to talk about money and church. Because if the only reason that I'm telling you to do this is for the survival of the institution, it feels kind of icky, right? Um, the invitation that I extend in this this morning is not for the health and the sake of the church. It is for the health and the sake of us as individual followers of Jesus. Hang with me. This story establishes the precedent of the tithe, giving 10% back to God. It's only in the 14th chapter of Genesis, but you'll see woven then throughout the Old Testament, people bringing the first fruits back to God, offering 10% of their harvest back to God, offering to God as a way of saying thanks and establishing that rhythm. In the 14th chapter of Genesis, verses 18 and following, King Melchizedek brings out bread and wine. This king is a priest of the God Most High. And so he blesses Abram and says, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abram gave him one-tenth of everything. The reason I read all of those verses, again, is because the order in which that exchange happens is significant, right? God gives the blessing. The blessing has already been received. And then responding to that, Abram gives the gift of the 10% back. There are some preachers, um, many of them even sometimes run successful TV ministries, right, who will flip that order on us and will tell you that if you give, right, Mail your gift now to our ministry, then God will bless you. Have you heard that pattern established? That manipulation becomes unfaithful and unhelpful. The invitation is for us to continue growing in an understanding that everything we have has been given to us by God. And we are invited to respond faithfully by giving a portion of that back to God. And so this idea of 10% becomes established as uh, the biblical norm for um, giving back to God. And I understand uh, that for many people who do not give at that level, the idea of giving at that level feels unfathomable or maybe even impossible, right? Um, one of the realities I, I have as we talk about um, the debt that cripples so many people is that even if you're not crippled by debt, many people today live with very little margin paycheck to paycheck, um, all of your dollars accounted for. And so the idea that you could give any more uh, is often really a struggle for people. And so what I want to invite you to is kind of the backing up in that and the reflection about how you prioritize being a generous giver in your life. Um, many of you have heard me talk before. Uh, Heather and I, when we were married uh, that summer between college and seminary, 
um, started seminary, both of us with a sense of what the debt load was going to be like coming out of that. Um, took jobs on campus in that first year, and we're making very little money. And so when you're making very, very little money, it's a great time to make the commitment to tithing, right? Because it's really easy. What is 10% of almost nothing? Even closer to nothing, right? Um, and then over the years, we began to grow in that. You know, the next year I took my first appointment, a little part-time thing at a church, and actually had a, a little salary. And shortly thereafter that, she started a job at a church that paid a little something. And we sought to continue uh, living and growing in that commitment to give 10%. Not because we were afraid that if we didn't give our 10%, the church would close or the church couldn't pay its bills, uh, but because we wanted to structure our lives and a rhythm in our lives uh, that put God as the priority in that. And fast forward a handful of years, almost a decade ago now, uh, we found ourselves living in some incredibly difficult times financially. Um, I think at one, one point we were working five part-time jobs between the two of us, trying to piece it all together. Um, but every month after we took Financial Peace University, we still made the Excel spreadsheet and, and on the top line had the giving amount there and, and continued that commitment to give 10% to Christ's ministries through the church. Um, I share all of that, not because I, I want to boast, but because I want to invite you uh, to think about how it might be possible, right? It might not be possible today to just flip a switch and start doing that, um, but as we close, I'll invite you again to look in a few minutes at that pathway and to just think about what's the next step that maybe uh, you take in 2019. Okay, talking about tithing, not for the sake of supporting the institution, but for a way of structuring and rhythm uh, your life. Um, sometimes people will ask me, uh, I get this question a lot actually, now, pastor, we love loopholes. Do I really have to tithe? Because that's Old Testament law, right? Like, it's in the Old Testament that we talk about tithing, but then Jesus comes and Jesus abolishes the Old Testament law or completes the Old Testament law, so do we really have to tithe? And that's where I often will point back to the text that we read in Matthew this morning, sometimes kind of tongue-in-cheek or in jest, but really with some seriousness also. Uh, because again, in here, there's a window to Jesus' deep call to commitment on our lives uh, and the challenge that exists as part of that. And so I'd invite you, open up your Bible again to that Matthew 19. At the very end of the 19th chapter of Matthew's gospel, um, there's a story told of the rich young man. It's found in different gospels, told in different ways, uh, but the pattern's the same. You know, somebody comes to Jesus and, and asks the question, kind of, what do I have to do uh, to get in? Right? Whatever the in is. In this case, it's what do I have to do uh, for uh, eternal life. And so Jesus talks to this young man about following the laws, the commandments, names some of the specific commandments. The, the young man says, I, I know, I, I do all of those things, so what am I lacking? And it's in verse 21 that Jesus offers that really challenging line. It says to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And so when I read this, especially in light of that question, you know, do we really have to tithe or doesn't Jesus offer us a different way? Um, I'll tell you, I hear Jesus' call in this text and I'm not there. Um, I have a wife and kids and we like to eat out on occasion and we like to travel and I like to be able to support my kids in the activities that they do and we save some money and, and think about retirement. And so when I hear Jesus say, uh, sell everything and give it all to the poor and then come follow me, I back up a half a step and I go, you know, the tithe sounds pretty good. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll set that as the goal and the rhythm for my life. Again, it, it sounds uh, challenging, I understand, uh, but the invitation is not to do that out of guilt or shame or obligation, and the point is not so that the church can continue to stay afloat. Um, there's lots of debate in church circles today about, you know, how much of financial information you share, what, when, why, how, you know. Um, if you have ever wondered or felt like um, you wish that there were some different communication from our church, hang tight. I'll have an invitation for you as we close this morning. Um, but the invitation would be that we give for our sake, for structuring and aligning our lives, that we are generous givers, uh, not for the sake of supporting an institution, but because together as a body we have said we want to live out this mission 
make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Again, I draw your attention to that discipleship pathway. I mean, the, the language is relatively simple there for those three uh, areas of being a generous giver. The starting point, the next step, the going deeper. Um, give once a month, you know, if you're able as a starting point if you don't do that. Uh, make a pledge, you know, somehow a proportion of your income uh, if you don't already do that. And, and then the tithe being the ultimate goal in that. One of the things I realized, though, as we've talked about this as the pathway is that there's even like, um, if this is the path, Maybe there's an on-ramp for some of us that needs to happen before we even take step one in this, you know. I think about those of us uh, who might be just crippled with debt of various kinds. And before you can even fathom freeing up any resources to share or to give generously, it might be that there's a backup and say, I've got to get my accounts in order, right? Maybe it is Financial Peace University or some kind of thing that helps you tackle debt or manage debt or put together some order in your finances do that so that you might grow as a generous giver. And then think about what the next step looks like. You know, if you never give anything, uh, what would it look like to begin giving something occasionally? And, and if you do that, you know, just uh, every once in a while give something. If you have a little left at the end of the month or it's convenience or you think about it, uh, maybe the next step is to be intentional about how you give. You know, to say, I'm going to give a fixed amount every week or month. And if you're doing that, um, maybe it's time to think about how sacrificial that really is. You know, does that hurt in some way? Are you sacrificing or giving up something else to do that? Um, my sense would be uh, for many of us, if we're throwing the same amount in that we did 40 years ago, maybe we're not stretching and growing in our generous giving. And ultimately, I'd invite you to all be working toward the goal of the tithe, even if that's something that is a decade from now, right? Uh, 1% this year, to next year, growing a little bit at a time closer to that, because it matters in your life. That you understand that your value and your worth is not tied to your bank account or your retirement plan. That your value and your worth is not connected to the things that you can purchase and collect and accumulate with the financial resources that you have. Your value and your worth come from the God who created you, who gives generously, and who invites us to live as generous givers. So may we be a people who are taking steps to shape our lives, to live in a rhythm of being a generous giver. I'll close quickly uh, with one last verse, not uh, read earlier or, or even shared in the week in the communications that we did, uh, but for me that captures really the essence of, of all of this. If you're carrying your Bible this morning, I'd invite you to go to 2 Corinthians. Uh, we'll be in the ninth chapter there. Um, this for me is the end about which we're talking, right? The discipleship pathway, the goal of tithing, uh, all of those things are a means to this deeper end of discipleship and what it looks like to live uh, in that relationship with God. Just looking at, again, ninth chapter, 2 Corinthians, we'll look at verses 6, 7, and 8, and then close. Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth, challenging those who are there uh, to live differently and to live with increasing faithfulness. The point, he says, is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And again, some translations will say joyful, cheerful, joyful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. We are invited to give generously, cheerfully, and joyfully, understanding that God is at work in the midst of that for every good work, for the pursuit of the mission to which we are called. So may we as individuals and as a community of faith live as generous givers with the hope that it will make a difference in our lives and make a difference in the world around us. Will you pray with me?
God, we are grateful. And we want to be joyful and cheerful. Yet we confess that we are so often influenced by the messages that surround us, telling us to hold tightly, to protect what is ours. And so often, God, we assume a posture with um, shoulders hunched and fists clenched, seeking desperately to cling to what we believe is ours. We pray that you would free us from that posture and open us to a new way of living, growing in an understanding that everything that we have and everything that we are comes as a gift from you, that we might share that freely with the world around us for the sake of the mission to which you call us. God, we are grateful and we are hopeful and we pray all of these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. But as you go forth from here today, uh, I hope that you continue to grow in the good news and the truth that God has created you and loves you, that everything that you are and have comes as a gift from God, and that as we go out into the world today, everywhere that we go, every interaction that we might have, we might continue to grow as generous givers so that all who see us might just want to know our God. Go in peace. Amen.